It's time to deal with those nasty cracks. Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bull. Yes, today we're going to deal with cracks. I hate cracks, but you know what? Turning wood bulls especially, we have to deal with cracks because they will occur occasionally. It's a good idea to know what causes cracks and essentially the moisture content in the wood that we use, because we're using large chunks of wood and we're, we don't buy dried commercial wood for making bull blanks because it's simply not available. There may be a very small amount of places that carry some large stock of material that can be turned into bull blanks that is actually equalized throughout. But that is extremely rare and it would be very expensive. Instead, we typically use logs or wood that we find or a tree that we cut down and we turn those big chunks of wood into bull blanks. And if it's not dealt with properly, there are going to be cracks. Now, the whole concept of what's going on inside that wood is rather complex, and I've developed an online course dealing with just the understanding of green wood. It's called Tree to Bull Understanding Green Wood, and you're going to want to check that out. I'll put a link in the description below. Check that out. You'll have a much better understanding of timber and wood and bull blanks and how to properly manage and maintain wood when before and after you turn wood bulls. All that being said, you're gonna have cracks occasionally. Now, there are different types of cracks. There are hairline cracks that are simply surface tension that make very fine, thin cracks on them. And quite honestly, they're usually not structural. They're not going all the way through the wood and they're more just aesthetic and they're pretty easy to fix. Sometimes we get larger cracks that are a little bit bigger than that. You might be able to see light through them. And occasionally we'll have wood that has some sort of defect. It could be a knot where the knot fell out and now you've got a hole. Or it could be wood like red cedar that has rot that goes through it, which is kind of typical for red cedar. Sometimes the imperfection of a crack on the surface of a bowl, if it's moves with the grain or if it just looks interesting, sometimes it's actually pretty cool to leave those in and just accept nature as it is. We don't have to be perfectionists all the time. But on the other hand, there are times when cracks are just disturbing. They're not visually appealing and they don't look so great. Or there's a big hole in the bottom of your bowl and it's not really that desirable. So in those instances, we need to go in and fix or patch those cracks so that it looks better, it's structurally more sound, and it just works. So today I'm going to share with you three ways of filling cracks or holes in your bowls. Okay, the first method I'm going to share with you is the super thin CA trick. Now, when I say trick, what is the trick? Well, super thin CA is thinner than water. It will get down into really fine cracks and go all the way down into them. And it's a great way to, to penetrate down into those cracks and create a good solid bond. Now, in order to do that and actually fill the crack, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to take some, some dust from the piece that you're working on and press that down into the crack first. But before you do all of that, I'm gonna share with you the top top secret for doing this really well. Now, if you've ever used CA directly on a crack before, you've noticed that there's this really ugly stain around that crack where the CA bled into the wood and it creates a stain. Well, guess what? There's a little secret. You can use a spray lacquer. It doesn't really matter what brand you use, but you can spray some lacquer over the crack area. Just a light spray over that area creates a mask. And that mask prevents the excess CA glue from bleeding into the wood around the crack. So by spraying that lacquer first, you're not going to allow the CA to stain the wood next to the crack. The CA will still be able to get down into the crack and bond it together, but you'll be able to sand that spray lacquer off the surface and you'll be left with clean wood on top. So the way we do this is you basically spray the lacquer, let it dry, 
the lacquer dries pretty quick, so you don't have to wait very long. And then you can press really fine dust down into that crack to fill it. And then you simply run some super thin CA down that crack and let it dry. Now you can also use accelerator if you'd like. Now there's rumors that using the accelerator actually causes the CA to become brittle sooner. I'm not so sure about that. It may be true, it may not be. I'm not quite sure, certain. I typically will just let it dry because it only takes a few seconds to dry. Okay, for the second technique I'm gonna share with you, we're gonna be using regular wood glue and sandpaper. That's it. The first technique I shared with you using CA, I don't use that one a lot. There's been a lot of information going around saying that the CA or super glue will break down over time. Some people say it takes maybe up to 10 years, but that CA actually gets brittle and starts breaking apart and doesn't hold its bond anymore. I don't know if that's true, it may be. I also have discovered that this technique using regular glue or wood glue and sandpaper is pretty amazing and it works really well. Also, my personal experience with wood glue is that it works for a very long period of time. Now I do use the Tight Bond 3, which is a water resistant glue so that if water does get down into that crack, it won't potentially dissolve the glue that's in there. But you can pretty much use any wood glue that you would like to use. The way this technique works is you use a small amount of glue, just enough to press it down into that crack. Again, kind of like the CA, we don't want to have a whole bunch of glue around the crack because it's potentially going to stain that wood. Instead, we want to just press glue down into the crack itself and then immediately start sanding the surface with the grain of the wood, with the surface grain of the wood. Now, why in the world would we sand immediately? Why not let that dry? And I got to tell you, the first time I was told about this technique, my brain immediately went to all the projects I've ever used wood glue in and that's pretty much you apply the wood glue and you gotta give it many hours to dry and I thought I'm turning this piece on the lathe I don't want to have to stop and wait for this glue to dry overnight plus as you may or may not know wood and a bull blank sitting overnight is most likely going to shift and change shape. So it's going to turn completely different the next day if you were to wait overnight for glue to dry. But I was relieved to discover that this technique does not require overnight drying, which is pretty cool. So essentially you just sand like crazy right over that surface. When you do this quick vigorous sanding, there's a whole bunch of things that happen all at the same time. Number one, you're cauterizing or heating up the surface of the glue and essentially drying it while you're creating really fine dust that is blending in with all of the wood surface and bonding with the glue itself. And by the time you've sanded it smooth, the crack has almost completely disappeared. Of course, you're still gonna be able to see some of the crack area, but all in all, it looks really good compared to having a big void there where the crack used to be. Now this technique can be used on all sorts of areas where there are cracks. You can even get up to some pretty good sized cracks with this. I've used it for really small hairline cracks. I've used it where grain se sections are separating. I've used this also where bark is separating away from the edge of a live edge bowl just to get some glue down in there to help bond the bark to the live edge. And that adds a lot of extra strength and it's completely invisible by using this sanding technique.
Now, the third technique that I'm going to share with you is more for filling voids. These typically occur when there's large cracks or an area of the wood where there might have been a knot or a rotted area. First thing you want to do is you want to go in with some type of tool and clear out any loose material around the inside of that void. If you've got loose material in there and you bond a filler with that, that filler may break free because of that loose material. So we want to clear off any loose material inside that void before we start filling it. The next thing we need to do when we're filling a large void is we need to think about where our filler is going to flow. And we usually have to mask up the back side of that void. You can use a masking tape, but I also really prefer using gaffer's tape. Gaffer's, gaffer's tape is more of a cloth material that really holds on and creates a strong bond. And it's very difficult for the epoxy that we're going to be using for, to ooze out the sides of this over time. Once the area is masked up and ready to be filled, I like to use a five minute epoxy. This is a two part epoxy. You've got an A and a B part, and these need to be mixed in equal amounts. Also, you're going to want to add a color filler. This can be done in a variety of different ways. You could use sawdust from the piece that you're turning, you could use a color accent. You could use all sorts of different things can be added to this epoxy. This is a lot like the resin epoxy that's super popular. You can add colors to it and things like that. This is different than most of the other epoxies though because it dries very fast. The one I use is a five minute epoxy. It's really nice to add color to your mix and to fill a void with color. A lot of times you'll see me using this blue turquoise mica powder. And there's a reason besides the fact that I like the way the color looks, there's a reason why I use that blue turquoise. Blue is the natural contrast of orange. And most of the tones of the wood have an orange hue to them. Some have a little bit of a reddish hue in, to them. Well, blue and turquoise is a natural contrast to that. They're opposite of each other on the color wheel, just like purple and yellow and red and green. Our eye is naturally drawn to contrasting colors. That's why a lot of times when you see turquoise next to orange or red, you're immediately drawn to it and you're inspired. And you're like, wow, that looks so cool. Well, it's a little bit of a trick because we are naturally drawn to contrast. So that's part of the reason why I do that. Now, granted, having that stark contrast might be too much for you. You may want to have your piece blend in and look more like the wood surrounding that void. In that case, obviously use different tones that match that wood. This is a good time to use dust from the wood. Just know that by putting the sawdust from your turning into the five minute epoxy mix, it's going to change the way it appears. So you may want to also add some other coloring into it just to make it blend a little bit more. Here's a mulberry piece that had a knot in the bottom of the bowl. A lot of times I'll leave these knots because I think they look really cool or the knot holes. I think they look pretty cool. However, this one's like right in the bottom and it's in the middle and it really draws in your eye and it just begs the question of why is there a hole in that bowl? <laughs> if it were higher up on one of the wings or something, it would be different. Instead, it's down in the bottom of this bowl. So I went ahead and filled it, but in this case, I didn't really want it to stand out. So I blended in a couple different colors just to add some unevenness to this. If, I, if you put in a solid color, it's going to look a little bit odd, especially a big area like the knot hole in this particular piece. If it's a solid brown trying to match that wood, it's going to actually stand out more because if you look at the wood surface, there's nothing that's solid on it anywhere. So you can easily add just a touch of color right before that 
epoxy sets up. So when you're getting to the point where it's starting to get thick, you can quickly mix in a little bit more color and move it around. And you're gonna see some of that swirling action. It won't quite blend into a solid color. That's another trick you can use. So with the five minute epoxy technique, you're really gonna to need to make sure that you have everything sealed up so the epoxy can't run out and go all over the place. And you wanna make sure you mix up enough to fill in that void and then give it plenty of time to set up. This will become hard and stiff in five minutes, but it's still kind of gummy. I've found that it typically takes about 30 to 45 minutes before it's hard enough to get back to turning. But again, that's not a very long period of time. If you use some of the popular resins that are out there that people do on countertops and that, it could take a day or two before you're ready to be turning again and be able to turn through that and cut it smoothly. But with five minute epoxy, it goes really quick. So there we have three different ways of dealing with cracks and voids in wood surface. Now remember, the more you know about wood and the more you understand about how to deal with timber, whether it's freshly cut or if it's been laying around or if it's been handed to you by somebody, the better off you're gonna be at avoiding those cracks. And check out my Treatable Understanding Green Wood online course. It's available to you right now. You can sign up, start going through the lessons, and start learning all you need to know about how to manage the wood properly for making bowls so that you don't have nasty cracks to deal with in the end. But like I said before, there are gonna be some cracks here and there. You can minimize those by understanding the wood, but you're gonna to have to deal with cracks. And so now hopefully you have these three techniques to use for managing the cracks that may appear in your bowl blanks or your bowls, and you will be able to address them going forward. All right, let me know what you think of these three techniques by leaving me a comment below. Also, if you're not subscribing yet, please do. I've got tons of great videos coming your way and you're not gonna wanna miss any. Be sure to click that bell next to subscribe so that you don't miss out on any of the upcoming videos. And if you haven't already, please click that like button. It helps this video, helps the channel, helps everything out, and I greatly appreciate it and I appreciate you for clicking the like button. Thank you so much. All right, guys, until next time, as always, Happy turning.